Good evening all, and welcome. Before the video begins, I just want to thank all of you who went over to some of my friends' channels and check out the content they're producing. As I said a few days ago in a previous video, a lot of stuff's been going on and I wanted to explain and share that with you. So you'll be able to listen at the very end of the video to a sort of mini update that I'm going to give you guys. I'm leaving it at the end for those of you who perhaps aren't really that interested, but it's going to be there if you want it. Thank you again to everyone who's gone over to my friends' channels and checked them out. You know, they've only started up and they're really working hard to see if, you know, they enjoy it and to just see what happens, really. And I'm, you know, really proud of them and really happy and just really grateful for everyone who went over. So thanks, guys. My brother from History Profiles has also started his up again. You know, he was having a lot of trouble with his job and finding the free time, but... Things have been changed around now, and he's going to have a lot more time to record and to set up a schedule, so I'm really glad to announce that he is back as well. So it's been, you know, three days, this is the third day in a row of me shouting someone out. But uh, if you would like to find out about my brother's channel, he tells um, stories from history, and it's really interesting to listen to, and if you guys would be interested, I'd really recommend it. You can check out his channel i'll be sure to leave a link at the end of the video for you guys to see just don't forget that we're coming to the close on the mega giveaway we're already on the eighth box and the second day in so tomorrow make sure to get your entries in and of course have watched today's and yesterday's in order to guarantee your place as the winner for box eight will be announced the day after and at that point there are only two boxes left so hurry and make sure you try and win but anyway, for now it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I should preface this by saying it was by far the scariest experience of my life and it's bringing tears to my eyes just remembering it. Basically, on the hill above the city I live, there are a string of rather large defensive forts. My grandfather was the curator and led tour guides of one of these forts. They date back to Napoleonic times, when the British were afraid of a French attack on the city, because of its importance to the supplies of the Navy. They're not incredibly creepy places. Maybe that's because I'd spend every weekend roaming the tunnels and doing errands there. But this one event left me shocked and incapable of going back down there alone, even 12 years later. As I mentioned, under the fort, are a network of tunnels that descend in places up to a hundred feet below the chalk. Some of them are to access the defensive trenches that form the fort's outer boundaries. Some of them contain gun emplacements, and all of them are gently sloping, hewn from rough chalk and dimly lit by the only kind of lights that work so far on the ground. Those dim mining ones that rely on the weakest electrical current. All of the tunnels were familiar to me, and they could all be accessed from the radial hub that was right in the depths of the fort, except for one. I had always been forbidden to walk down it, the tunnel was of a rougher construction than the rest, unlit and never used. Other than that, from the top end it was fairly unassuming, just something I was never allowed to see. That was until I pestered my grandfather so much that he decided to show me. He grabbed a flashlight and we started walking down the tunnel. I immediately regretted my decision. I wish I had photographs of it, but the smooth chalk walls I was used to in the other tunnels 
were replaced by this jagged texture that threatened to draw blood if you scraped them with an unlucky limb. My grandfather, curiously, was aiming the torch beam at the left wall of the tunnel, searching for something. He found it, perhaps halfway down, there, inscribed in the chalk, was a rough cross and a date that was nigh illegible. This is why you're not supposed to come down here, he said. The tunnel was supposed to be condemned. Someone was crushed right here. A chill ran through me, and I asked to leave. My grandfather chuckled and carried on, saying that there was nothing to worry about. I started to get a bad feeling from then on, as if someone was following us. Eventually, we reached the bottom. A fairly regular gum replacement met us. Then we turned to leave. The nature of the tunnels meant that you could see all the way up to the other end, where the door-shaped piece of light meant the security of the radial hub. What me and my grandfather saw chills my bones. And like I said, means I can't go down there anymore. We were a hundred percent the only people in there at the time. We were sure of it. It was out of hours, and my grandfather always locked the main gate behind us whenever we entered the tunnel system, in order to stop people from trespassing and stealing the cannons or old munitions. I swear to you, good listeners, we saw the silhouette of a man slowly walk across the top of the tunnel, turn to face down at us, and then carry on. My grandfather is a brave man, but he looked visibly aggrieved. What was worse is we knew we had to run up the tunnel to get out, or we would be stuck in a 100 foot trench in the middle of winter. We had to pass the cross of that crushed tunnel worker. And we made it back. We obviously made it out alive. But when someone tells me they don't believe in ghosts, I tell them this story. And it brings a tear to my eye every time I tell someone about it. I work in a nursing home. So we have weird things happening all of the time. Socks travelling around the halls by themselves, cupboards opening, and stuff flying out. Lights turning on and off. Washing machines just sitting at full of ice water for no reason. But our Alzheimer's unit has the most activity. All of our Alzheimer's rooms have special sensors, so we know if a resident is getting out of bed or is leaving their room. It is to assure that we know where they are and that they don't fall. One particular night, a call light kept going off, promptly, followed by that room's bathroom sensor being tripped. This room's resident had passed away three days before and we didn't have anyone else in there yet. We turned it off about three or four times an hour, and we were pretty creeped out. Then at 10pm, just an hour before it was time for me to leave, we heard a lady screaming for help. We ran back to the source, and it turned out to be coming from that same room. The bathroom sensors started going off again right as we got there. We had to check in case some other resident had gone in, but there was no one. The sink and shower were both running at full blast with ice cold water. I turned everything off and reset the switch and gently pulled the door closed as I left. Halfway through closing it, someone or something slammed it closed for me. 
and I almost had my shoe caught. I refused to go back in for the rest of the night. This isn't my own story, but my atheist, non-spiritual, cynical best friend's afterlife story. To know this kid, and to have him tell this story whilst he's visibly trembling, scared the living shit out of me. And still does. He moved into his grandfather's house a few years ago, so that he could take care of him, since his grandfather was frail and sadly dying of cancer. One night, after his grandfather had come and taken a turn for the worse, my friend was sitting in the living room, watching whatever comes on basic cable at 2am. He didn't get home from work until around midnight every night, and he heard a loud crash coming from his grandfather's bedroom. Thinking that his grandfather had fallen out of bed again, he ran down the hall, opened the door, and saw his grandfather was still in bed. But with his back turned towards the door, and his right arm reaching for something in the far corner of the bedroom. That's when my friend saw sparks floating in and out of the wall and ceiling. He watched for about three or four minutes. His grandfather's arm went back down, and the sparks disappeared through the right wall. My friend closed the bedroom door, thinking that he was completely losing his mind and hallucinating, and sat back down in the living room. The next morning, he was sitting at the kitchen table eating breakfast, when his grandfather sat down with him over oatmeal, and they were both just sitting there eating in silence. My friend said, Hey, pup, I heard some loud crashing noises coming from your room last night. Was everything all right? His grandfather immediately said, You saw them? Then went on about how his dead brother, cousin, and some other dead family members came to take him away. But he was telling them that he wasn't ready to go, and that they needed to go away. And some other stuff that I can't remember. His grandfather died about a month later. He told me this story, a couple of days after it happened and I've heard him say it a few times since. It never changes. One night, I was in bed, getting ready to go to sleep. I was around 17 and living in my parents' basement. I heard someone open the basement door and start walking down the steps. It sounded like they were wearing flip-flops, which was odd, because it was clearly very cold outside at this time. They came down the steps, and then it stopped. I could hear the flip-flop sound the whole way down. I thought it might be my brother, but he was out with friends and never wore flip-flops. I call out anyway. Jake? Is that you? But I receive no answer, and the flip-flop sound persists walking towards my door. Mum? Dad? The knob on my door started to move. No dice. It was locked. There was an audible disappointed sigh. Then, flipping, flopping away from the door, and back up the steps. I was straight up scared, so I went to the living room, and... I grabbed a baseball bat, and went out to the living room, dividing the bedrooms. There was nothing. No one in the bathroom, no one in my brother's room, and no one on the steps. We had two phone lines at the house. So I called my parents' line. Dad, did you see headlights coming up the driveway or hear anyone come in the house? He hadn't. 
Did your mum just come down wearing flip-flops? What? No. Go back to bed, son. So I did. Eventually, I thought someone had snuck into our house. It was the most genuinely terrified I'd ever been. Not until the next day did I realise that one year ago to the day, my cousin had taken his own life. I was one of the last people to speak to him, and we'd made plans to catch up together. We never, of course, made it to said plans. And he wore flip-flops almost every single day. Sometimes I wonder what would have happened if the door would have been unlocked. When I was 13, we had a huge German Shepherd, who was seven at the time. This dog was a beast. He wasn't afraid of anything, ever. Constantly following me to school and waiting for me to come home, at the foot of our driveway. All around a great, great dog. Again, let me re-emphasize. This dog wasn't afraid of anything. Anyway, we bought this house that we were living in at the time for super cheap, because the previous owner had hung himself in the downstairs coat closet, and it wasn't selling fast enough. One day, I walked down the stairs to see my dog staring at the closet just staring. So, he's standing up, tail between his legs, and isn't moving an inch, just staring at it. The door was open, which was weird, because people in my house are usually good at closing things up. I go over to Rodney, my dog, and try to see if there's something in the closet from where he's looking. I can't see anything, but the closet is super dark and I tried to snap Rodney out of it, but he won't budge. He just keeps staring and staring, and I'd never seen my dog like it. The most horrifying part? Rodney's head is moving slightly from left to right, like he's following the movements of something hanging in the closet. Also, there's another story that happened when I was younger and happened when I remember feeling fear. I've also had other encounters. The first that I can remember happened when I was around eight or nine. I had this group of friends that always hung out together and stayed at each other's houses and generally had a good time. Well, we decided we were all going to stay at my friend Eddie's house that night. Everyone had clothes and the necessities except for Jake, whose house we never stayed at because of the stories that he told us. He lived in this old white house with these steps that go more vertically than horizontally, very steep and very shallow steps. He would tell us stories about how things would bang on the walls near his bed and he would hear things running up and down the hallway at night. Being the badass he was, they never seemed to bother him or his mother. Now it was decided he needed to get his shit together. So we have one of the parents drive us over there. Not even the parents wanted to go into the house. And I realise now that he sends us all up to get the stuff. So we go in and we're all near the middle of the stairs going up to his room. At this point, we hear what sounds like someone running from the basement up the stairs into the hallway. So we all book it the rest of the way. I was the last in line, and just as I was heading to the top of the stairs, I heard it round the corner, where we were all currently running. I looked down and saw nothing, but I heard the spirit start running impossibly fast up the stairs. We got inside the room as it got to the top, and it ran down the hallway, and again we saw nothing. So we were all standing in his room, 
as he gathers his things, and no one was particularly freaked out by what had just happened, which was odd. I'll just chalk it up to being young and naive, or just plain stupid. I was quietly walking around, checking out all the guns and knives he had in his room, when suddenly the lights go off, and I hear the door slam. I turned pale white, and whipped around and noticed all my friends had snuck out and left me. I quickly ran over, and ripped the door open. As I took my first step out the room, I heard the sprint similarly run out one of the rooms and give chase. I got to the top of the stairs, and I took two steps and realised I would never make it down quick enough. So I did what any reasonable person would do. I jumped, hit the ground, rolled and sprinted for the front door. I heard the spirit run back down towards the basement, just as I neared the front door and I saw my two friends laughing, preparing to hold the door closed from the outside. Normally that may have worked as I was the youngest and the smallest of the group of friends, but not this night, when I had adrenaline surging through my veins and more anger than the Hulk. I had the strength of five small nine-year-old children and I didn't even slow as I neared the door. I simply reached out, twisted the knob, and shoulder smashed the door and sent my friends sprawling. Reliving this tale has sent adrenaline in my veins. A few years later, my friend and his mum moved from the house and had it demolished. It was one creepy house, that's for sure. And I never did go back there after that first time. I was around 13, and my cousin, who was 15, were babysitting my little sister, who was around the age of one, give or take a few months. It was summer out, and the sun wasn't quite setting, but it wasn't high in the air. We were just sitting around bullshitting, watching TV, as my sister crawled around on the floor. Great time to be alive, right? We were the only two home, and my house is far out in the country near a lake. We have a neighbour that is also a relative, and pretty close, who lives about half a mile away. I've never really had any issues with paranormal things in my house. Never really been scared to be home alone in the middle of nowhere. This day didn't really change that, even though it scared the bejesus out of me. So we were sitting around having a good time, waiting for my parents to return. Then I hear something downstairs, and I'm trying to listen for it in the middle of my cousin talking, and the TV going and my sister being a toddler. I didn't hear anything for a while, so I just let it go. And after about five minutes we heard something crash to the floor downstairs. My cousin and I look at each other. We mute the TV and listen. More stuff is being knocked over down there, and we start to get nervous. Suddenly it all stops, all is quiet, and we hear someone jiggling the door handle. The door squeals open, and we hear the footfalls of someone walking out of the room. Still looking at each other, we mouth, should we go? We both nod, stand up, grab my sister, and this doesn't sit well with both of us. It then starts stomping up the stairs fairly quickly and we run out the house. We quickly made our way to our relative's house, but never told anyone exactly why we left. My parents got home later in the evening, and my cousin and I checked downstairs to see what fell. And as far as we could tell, nothing was out of place. It was rather intriguing to say the least, and my cousin never stayed with us again. My best friend dreamed about my stepfather getting stabbed. My family was pretty white trash, and on one particular evening, my uncle and stepfather got into an altercation outside of our house, where my stepfather got stabbed in the back. He fell on me coming back inside, and in the process, I got coated in blood. The cops were called, 
and he was taking in an ambulance as my mother and myself drove to the hospital. This was about 1am. This is before the internet and cell phones and all that jazz. So there was no way for anyone beyond our next door neighbours to know about this. When we returned back to the house, four or five hours later, there was a message on the answering machine from my best friend. She was crying and apologising for calling so late, but asking me to call her right away, because she had a dream of me being covered in blood. The message was the time stamped as the same time the incident occurred, round about 1am. We had missed her call because we were outside with the paramedics. When I was younger, I would wake up in the night and see maggots or worms crawling on the ceiling. I would feel like time was moving slowly. And when I got up during these episodes, and would feel like I had shifted completely out of reality, and began having very bizarre and frightening visions. Huge, black vistas, with floating black stone monoliths, hanging in them. I would see other stuff too, like the shadow of a person walking past my room, when everyone else was downstairs, and I also caught the sight of blood dripping from the ceiling out of the corner of my eye a few times. Not much happens recently, but all my life I've tended to wake up just before something happens in the room. Like for example, things falling off chairs, posters falling down, lights inexplicably being turned on, and doors opening late at night. The weirdest thing is that none of this really freaks me out. I just accept that it's there and not to be feared. Also, my aunt lives in a previously haunted house, and some creepy shit went on there apparently. They would hear the sounds of scraping from inside the walls, lights would blink on and off, and one time a dimmer switch turned itself on. Note, this was a slider switch on the floor operated manually, which my aunt watched being moved by an invisible force. They would go into rooms where no one else had been in to find an extremely strong smell of old lady perfume. One time, they jokingly said that if there is a ghost in the house, blink the lights twice. And they did. Turns out that an old lady had killed herself in the house before they moved in. They had the house exorcised, and every time the person came, they could supposedly feel a presence in the house, and one of an old lady at that. Creepiest part is, the exorcist didn't know that an old lady had died there, until after she felt the presence. It seems like the procedure was successful, because since then, there's been no more activity. My great grandpa was a lazy, mean, rude jackass, who didn't care about anyone but himself. He would go to work, come home, expect dinner to be laid on the table, and then go to bed, every day. And he was always nasty to my great grandma. My great grandma kept complaining that he never fixed any of the various problems around the house. The stove wasn't working right. Some parts of the house were practically falling apart, and there were leaks in the roof and holes in the floor. It was a mess. Of course, he would just yell at her and tell her that it wasn't his problem. Well, one day, he ends up dying. And even though he was still a giant jackass, my great-grandma still loved him, and she felt miserable over his death. So, a few days after his funeral, her friend decided to take her out and spend the day away from the house, to try and take her mind off it. She comes back a few hours later, and the door is unlocked. She thinks someone's broken in, so she panics and rushes around the house. Then she notices something. The roof is fixed, the floor is fixed, and the stove is fixed. 
everything that she complained to her husband about was repaired. She then went back to the front door and noticed that his favourite shoes were sitting in front of the door and his favourite coat was sitting on the coat rack next to the door. The door was open and while she could still see out the door, the door closed all on its own. When I was nine or ten, I used to have to lay on the floor to sleep. I'm not sure why I did it. I just found it more comfortable for a while. It was a weird phase. Anyway, I was in my bed and I had just burritoed myself up in all the blankets and sheets, took my pillows and flopped them on the floor to settle in for the night. I remember rolling over to push away a toy or something near me. So I had the space to sleep, and in that exact moment, a hand came through my floor. It looked as if someone had set its opacity in Photoshop to 65%, and it was definitely human. It reached for me in a grabbing motion. However, I don't think it could grab me, because it went straight through my arm just passing through it. My body went numb. I'm not sure if it was from touching me, or if it was due to fear, but I didn't think about it. I just ran, and I spent the rest of my night in my mum's room. Another story I have is when I had a birthday party in the same house. I was a little older, maybe 11 or 12, and I had invited five or six of my best friends to come. We got bored with whatever we were doing. So I suggested we go ghost hunting, since I had a friend who told me that things went on in my house. Strange noises and the feeling of someone watching you, as well as the hand. Being kids, they all loved the idea, and we started roaming the house with our hands posed into finger guns pointing and shooting. It was just a fun game, but then in my living room, I pointed at a random spot near the TV and yelled bang. There was a loud thump, like something big had just been dropped on the floor near where I pointed, and a touch activated toy near the spot went off, just like in the movies. I remember my face going flush, turning around and exchanging the you heard it two face with my friends. This happened in college, conveniently right near Halloween. My friends at the time were quite diverse in our religious beliefs, and it being All Hallows Eve, my Wicca friend wanted to show us all his beliefs. I enjoy the paranormal, and I always have, and as a man of science, I enjoy trying to explain the explainable. Mostly, I enjoy the psychology of it watching our brains trying to piece together things they want to believe. The subconscious grasping of fragments of reality resulting in psychosomatic hallucinations. He said he wanted to try and summon something, and he said to trust him. And trying to remain sceptical, we indulged in his request. He lit candles and turned off the lights as we formed a circle around the candles. We sat down and held hands, as my friend bowed his head and began humming. He kept humming his om as we closed our eyes, and suddenly, an image of a cottage entered into my head. It was so surreal and clear, I could feel myself there. It was a calm grass field, and I was just standing at the forest edge when I slowly walked up the path to the cottage. It had two floors, and it was a natural wooden brown. I looked over at the window near the door, and shattered. And then my girlfriend at the time screamed. She got up and ran out of the room, and another one of my friends jolted back and started yelling, Oh God, what did you see? He then starts frantically talking about how he saw himself as a werewolf, and then he started talking about the details, 
that he was in a field. He ran towards a house. It was what I saw. Everything. It wasn't just some vague details, but everything from the fields to the colours. Everything I asked about the windows, because I remember one was broken, and he said he saw himself jumping through it. We stared at each other and knew. We saw the same thing. We heard my girlfriend scream again, and we ran out of the room to check in on her. She was cowering in a corner crying. She's a hysteric, and won't stop crying about her children. She doesn't even have children. She's in tears out of what happened. And when she says the dogs got them, that they attacked them, and started talking about all the blood, we stood there in silence, mouths agape, regarding what we had just heard. When I was a little dude, probably four or five, my little sister, who was one year younger than I, shared a bedroom. Our bedroom door looked over the living room wall, and behind that area was our playroom. The playroom was a level lower and had huge ceilings. So the living room was roughly six to eight feet above the playroom. One night, I woke up and saw a dark, blue hooded figure holding what looked like a candle coming through the wall. It looked towards our bedroom and then continued to float into the living room. I was so little I just hid under my blankets. A few years later, when we lived in a different house, I was telling my mum the story about the blue thing that I saw when I was in the old house. My sister was doing homework at the table and her ears perked up before I finished my story and said, Did it have a candle? Yeah. Did it come through the living room wall? Yeah. Did it look into the bedroom? Uh, yeah, actually. Then my mum says, Uh, it didn't have a hood by any chance, did it? Yeah. What the hell was it? My mum says, I don't know. Your father used to tell me that he saw the blue cloaked guy with a hood and a candle hanging out by the barn rafters at night. I always assumed he was drunk or high, but I never believed him until now. I can still picture that thing so vividly. My sister and I are in our early 30s, but we still talk about it on occasion. In my final year of college, I lived alone in an apartment. I loved it, until I started dealing with something weird. There were whispers in my ear when I'd go to sleep at night, which I always just chalked up to thinking. But then it became weirder. I thought I saw someone in my kitchen area when I was in the shower. The bathroom door didn't have a vent, so I left the door open when I showered. Whenever I'd go to shave my legs, I'd prop one on the back of the tub, only to feel like someone was staring at me from where the toilet was. It was a very deep unsettling feeling, and again, I chalked this up to my weird self weirding me out, even though this happened all the time. But what confirmed it for me, was one night when something got thrown across my kitchen. A few minutes later, I had turned my lights out to go to bed, and in the morning, I found my beach stone had been sitting on the table on the other side of the apartment, and it was right next to the front kitchen door. The apartment was in a building that used to be a house which was converted into apartments. It was a super deal building, and had a lot of quirks to it. My apartment used to be the attic which was later converted to a top floor apartment. When I was 15, my best friend went to see his pastor uncle out on the East Coast and came back with quite a tale. He had been exorcised of many different demons. This is not that story, but rather my own. After his experience, 
He told me all about it, and prayed that I experience something similar. So one night, I was standing outside smoking a cigarette, and I had this epiphany. I was going to witness the end of the world, and I needed to be physically and mentally prepared in order to help people in the end of times. As I'm having this thought, something in my head said, no you're not, like a voice that wasn't mine. And right at that moment, I realized something was standing inside of me. Then I proclaimed, yes I am. And what I felt was like someone stepping outside my body and going behind me. I freaked out and ran inside. So I'm sitting in my living room by myself, freaked out and the phone rings. I answer, and there is a roar, an evil sound, a non-English crap on the phone, and I hung up. I threw the phone and then ran into my room. Then I'm just sitting in my room praying and I felt a good presence around me. After a minute or two, I look up on my wall and there is what I describe as the absence of light in the shape of a human, walking towards me, but on the outside of the wall, like it couldn't enter the room but I could somehow see it through the wall. It was as if you drew an outline around someone. Then, on the inside, it was just dark. So dark, it was the absence of light. At this point I freak out again, and run into my brother's room and just sit there paralysed. This is the only time I have seen or felt anything like this. I'm not super religious, but this definitely changed my views on the matter. When I got married last year, I wanted to devote a small portion of the ceremony to my grandmother, who raised me. She had recently passed away. The minister announced that we were lighting a candle in her memory. I walked over to the table with the candle and struck the match. And as I was lighting it, a number of the guests phones started ringing loudly. The noise startled me and I looked at the crowd and about five or six people were fumbling with their cell phones, trying desperately to turn them off. My father was one of them and he was in the front row very close to me. He was obviously extremely embarrassed, and looked up at me, and I could tell he was having trouble, getting it to stop making noise. But when I reached out to see if I could help him, all the phones went quiet, and we paused for a moment and resumed the ceremony. This might not seem strange, but at this point, I had no thoughts of the supernatural. I was just slightly annoyed that people caused an interruption with their phones during my wedding. Anyway, a little after, my dad came up to me and apologised and kept talking about how crazy it all was. He swears that his phone was on silent mode and that there were no missed calls in his logs. I'm 99% sceptic, but it was really weird for five or six people to get phone calls. I know it's mostly self-comforting, but it's nice to think that she may have been around on the day that was very important to me, and that those six phones ringing were her way of letting me know from the other side that she's happy for me, or proud of me. Either way, Grandma, I hope you're in a better place. My father was diagnosed with COPD in October of 2010. He had been an alcoholic for as long as I can remember, which led to his death even faster. He would not stop drinking or smoking, even though he had an illness that could lead to his death. A week before Christmas, 
a year after he found out, my mum and I caught the flu. It was bad. My dad was not doing too good at all. He couldn't get up. He was just going through this weird absence where he would only say a few things. Lord, I love you. Please help me. Were a few examples. He would look at me like I was not there and point to his TV controller at the wall and try and change the channel on the TV. But the TV was on the opposite side of the room. I now know that he was having seizures from alcohol withdrawal. But anyway, back to being sick. I couldn't get back up to help him, as my mother and I were his caretakers since he would not allow anyone else, including nurses, to look after him. My mum went outside, and she was feeling a little better. So she could get some fresh air, and my father kept calling out to her. Karen? Karen! I kept hearing. Even though I could hardly move, I got up from the couch and opened the door. What do you need? Mum's outside. I was shaking horribly. The last words he said to me were, That's alright, Maul. Go lay down. I love you. When my mum came in, she called an ambulance because he was not doing well at all. Christmas Day rolls around and we open presents and such. My dog goes over to my dad's bedroom door to try and see if he will come out too. My heart just sank, and at around 12 after eating lunch, we got the call. This is the doctor, and I'm sorry to inform you, but John has passed away. It was very sad, but I never cried. I hardly felt anything, to be honest. I was sad, but I never cried. I hardly felt anything, to be honest. I never really felt like I lost something that day. Fast forward a few weeks. I'm at my sister's house, and I have a strange dream. I walk out of my bedroom door, and there's my father sitting at the kitchen table drinking his coffee like he used to. He looked very healthy. I asked him, Where are you staying? He replied, Oh, I'm staying at Connie's apartment. Connie is my aunt who died a year before. My hallway, which didn't have a door before for some reason, had one. He had me follow him, and we were at my aunt's. I asked him a few more questions, and that was it. I thought I'd just had a dream, because I missed him, but I now know that wasn't the case. So, anyway picked up his ashes from the funeral home. And then strange things started to happen at my house. It's usually a comfortable environment. It's usually a comforting environment. But it felt very eerie for some reason. I was in my good evening all, and welcome. Before the video begins, I just want to thank all of you who went over to some of my friends' channels and check out the content they're producing. As I said a few days ago in a previous video, a lot of stuff's been going on and I wanted to explain and share that with you. So you'll be able to listen at the very end of the video to a sort of mini update that I'm gonna give you guys. I'm leaving it at the end for those of you who perhaps aren't really that interested, but it's gonna be there if you want it. Thank you again to everyone who's gone over to my friends' channels and checked them out. You know, they've only started up and they're really working hard to see if, you know, they enjoy it and to just see what happens, really. And I'm, you know, really proud of them and really happy and just really grateful for everyone who went over. So thanks, guys. My brother from History Profiles has also started his up again. You know, he was having a lot of trouble with his job and finding the free time, but... Things have been changed around now, and he's going to have a lot more time to record and to set up a schedule, so I'm really glad to announce that he is back as well. So it's been, you know, three days, this is the third day in a row of me shouting someone out. But uh, if you would like to find out about my brother's channel, he tells um, stories from history, and it's really interesting to listen to, and if you guys would be interested, I'd really recommend it. You can check out his channel i'll be sure to leave a link at the end of the video for you guys to see just don't forget that we're coming to the close on the mega giveaway 
We're already on the eighth box and the second day in, so tomorrow make sure to get your entries in and of course have watched today's and yesterday's in order to guarantee your place as the winner for box eight will be announced the day after and at that point there are only two boxes left. So hurry and make sure you try and win. But anyway, for now it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. And I, well I wasn't lying. He didn't want her there. We instantly knew that these things were not in our heads and that he was actually still here. I got up the courage to go into his room, which now felt very creepy unlike before, and I tried speaking to him. Obviously it was a one-sided conversation, but I felt him behind me listening. I told him it wasn't very nice to scare Paula, but I know how much he hated other people being in his room. Before I left, I told him I missed him. A few days later, my boyfriend heard him call out, Maul, are you there, Maul? I stopped for a little while. Then we had our final encounter. It was another dream. It started in my room again, where I walked out into the hallway, and he was just standing there with a big grin on his face. I stared at him, and he just kept smiling and his big blue eyes were filled with happiness, instead of the cold grey eyes that he had before. That was my dad. He had not been himself in years, and it took his death to finally free him from his suffering. He was at peace. I also was different in the dream. I was my ten year old self. When I was ten, life was good. I had a healthy, happy father, and I was a happy little girl. It went downhill when I was in middle school, and my father started drinking more. I then ran at him, hugged him, and I couldn't stop crying. He just smiled and patted my head. He didn't even say a word, but I felt so much comfort in him holding me. I talked about not crying and not feeling much when he died, that I didn't feel like I'd lost anything. But when I woke up that morning, I had the feeling that I lost something. I knew he was gone for good. That dream would be the last I'd ever see of him. And that was his way of saying goodbye. I lost it and started bawling. After that, nothing else ever happened. And the house was comfortable again. He just didn't want to leave without telling his little girl goodbye. Well, that's my story. I know most of you won't believe it, but it's true. I miss my dad. So this happened while I was living at home. I hear a glass breaking in the middle of the night. I think someone is trying to break in or something. So I call my grandpa as he lives downstairs, since my mum was away from the weekend. I wake him up and start searching upstairs while he searches downstairs, with not a single piece of broken glass to be found. I shrug it off and forget about it. A month later, my mum bursts into my room in the middle of the night, whispering and yelling about hearing broken glass and thinking someone is breaking in. I sleepily tell her that it's nothing, and I heard it a few months ago as well. She decides to go downstairs and check it out just to be sure. On our wooden mantle above the fireplace, we keep a religious candle. This one, I believe, was the sacred heart of Jesus burning all the time. We've had it for the past 21 years, and I think even before that. Nothing like this had ever happened. My mum walks downstairs to see if half of the candle glass had been shattered. The liquid wax poured out into a river, and somehow the flames travelled down the liquid wax, and lit a little corner of our wooden mantelpiece on fire. I have never seen glass break happen like that, and I've seen a lot of glassware break in my time. 
in labs and in chemical engineering student life for many different pressures, temperatures and stress factors. And I have never been more scared in my entire life. I was sleeping on the couch at a friend's apartment, talking on the phone at 11pm, with the lights off and only the TV on. When I see the shadow of a person walk from the kitchen to the bedroom hallway, I felt bad and thought that I had woken up her boyfriend, so I called out, Mike? to get no answer. So I got up and walked the six feet from the end of the couch to the hallway bedroom door. Bathroom was wide open and empty. Though it was creepy, laughed on the phone, we went to sleep. I woke up next morning about to hop in the shower. So I got undressed and began brushing my teeth. When I see these weird marks on my thigh, two perfect sets of fingertip bruises, like someone had been grabbing my legs from behind and pulling them apart, that weren't there the night before, and I hadn't done it in weeks, completely freaked out. So I told my friend what happened, and she just eye leveled with me and said, well, things like that happen here. Turns out, the graveyard across the street was pretty active when it came to odd lights and sights. They had things move around in their apartment after they first moved in, and had gone to the apartment manager thinking they may not have re-keyed after the last tenant. She pulled a stack of pictures out of her desk, and my friend said some of them were old school Polaroids, and they were taken with orbs, weird shadows, even had a kid sitting in a chair that had what looked to be a hand resting on his shoulder. These pictures had been accumulating for over 20 years, and people seeing and hearing strange things about the buildings and the grounds? Obviously management knew about it, but what were they going to do? They told my friends that if anything really out of hand happened, to notify them immediately. I had went to bed at 10pm, and woke up at 1am. I thought about my best friend, and I had started to worry. I had mumbled something he had said to me to comfort myself, so that I could sleep again. And that was, I won't ever leave you. I'll always protect you. Don't worry. With that, I had fallen back asleep. In my dream, I was in the corner of this building, and this building had beige walls and a brown wall accent. There were these two large blue doors in the front, and they were very distinct because of the contrast between the blue and the beige. There were tables and chairs all in neat rows, and sitting in some of the chairs were people. They were hunched over and motionless and one lady turns over and smiles at me. I take it as a signal to continue walking, so I did, and I looked down to my left as I was walking, and there were empty picture frames on two tables. Between these tables was a makeshift room, and in the room lay a casket. It was a beautiful casket. I tried to peek inside to see who it was, but there was no face, just a body. I touched the suit the body was wearing and grabbed the hand. I didn't know why I grabbed the hand, but it gave me an incredible sense of comfort. So I held the hand for a minute, and then I walked out, and that was it, and I woke up. A few minutes later, I'd gotten off the phone from my best friend's sister, saying that at 1am he was murdered and had died on the scene. His funeral was a few days later, and was exactly like the one in my dream. When I was around 20, I was going to school in Pittsburgh, living in an area mostly surrounded by the universities. I was alone in my basement apartment for the weekend. 
It was Friday night at around 8pm, and I was alone letting myself wind down for the night. I had to be up at 4am next morning to open up at the bagel shop, and there was a tap at the back door. Not a knock, think Morse code. Most of the houses I've lived up at were old in Maine, and this wasn't an exception. I wrote it off and kept watching TV. The tapping sound started again, and I was hoping to ignore it, but I realised I couldn't ignore the mass volume of people who requested it. It was too perfect to be a house settling, and I realised there was something to it. This would usually be all good and well, but it was winter, and my back door and my base freezer apartment were under a storm door, locked from the inside. This was weekend six after Snowmageddon. So my back door under a storm door, locked from the inside, is also three feet under of snow. Eventually the tapping became so frequent, I decided to investigate. As I got closer to the door and tapping sound, I put my ear up to the door, and as I did, it went from clapping to slamming. All I could think to say is, I know you could go, please go away, and ran into my house. The next day, I gathered enough courage to open the door. The padlock was still done. I went through my kitchen's neighbour upstairs to get into the backyard, and my storm stellar was still under the pristine blanket of snow, and no one had been able to bear it or roll it into a cat or a snowman. Every now and again, the certain important situations I'll hear about the taps, and usually followed by something benign.